We have been um, studying the um, covenants to try to understand what the desire of God and the plan of God is for the salvation of humanity in understanding the covenants and the plan of salvation there is so much study required that we could have 10 lifetimes and still find more truth and still find more guidance we are going to go ahead and study the scriptures with regards to the Jewish feasts and where we see the plan of salvation, the seven annual Jewish feasts in the agricultural calendar of the Jewish nation in the Old Testament. But before we even get to that study, to understand the Mosaic Covenant, in order for us to understand the Mosaic Covenant, we have to understand the Jewish annual feasts. And so we will have to dig into that. But in making sure that our church services don't turn into a classroom where we have just lectures which are only intellectual and which are only uh, informational, we need to make sure that our studies here are also a worship and that we combine knowledge and worship so we have a Sabbath experience and a church experience here. As a result, we will travel through these teachings week by week where we combine the teachings of the covenants, teachings of the Bible, and how they relate to our lives. Today, what I'd like to do is take a look at the covenant of Abraham as seen in the New Testament. I should start by informing you, most of you or many of you may already know this because we've talked about it, the Old Testament and the New Testament, really, the word testament means covenant. The Old Testament is the old covenant which is built around the covenant that God made with humanity through whom? Abraham. And that covenant was going to find its fulfillment in that king that we find in 2 Samuel that God promised through the Davidic covenant. The, the Davidic covenant was a sub-covenant of the Abrahamic covenant. And that king to come whose throne would last forever would be Jesus Christ. And he and his covenant is found in the New Testament, and the New Testament is really another word for a new covenant. So the entire Bible goes into either the Old Testament, Old Covenant, or the New Testament, or the New Covenant. In these two is the entire scripture. Jesus in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, is that seed who crushes the heel, the head, of the seed of the Satan, of the serpent, which is in Genesis chapter 3. That is the old covenant, the promise that will be fulfilled in the coming of Jesus Christ. The reason that I wanted to talk about the subject today was because within our study, discussions come up within people in the congregation and on the internet, those that watch on the internet, and discussions come up and people become a little bit confused. And somehow, for some reason, people begin to think that what we are teaching here is that we don't have to follow the law of God. But I want to clarify that. And some weeks ago, I paraphrased uh, somebody else, R.C. Spruill, who said that we are saved by the keeping of the law. That is the only way that we can be saved, by keeping of the law. 
righteousness by works. But not the righteousness of my works, the righteousness of the works of Jesus Christ. We are saved by works. And we're not teaching here a doctrine that is called antinomianism, which means you do away with the law. Antinomianism means that you are anti-law. We're not. Today we want to take a few minutes and study this. And by the way, when I say a few minutes, it's going to be quite a few minutes. I doubt that we will be able to cover all the material that we need to cover. Today we may go into two, possibly three weeks. To do that, to understand that, we want to cover a couple of passages. One is in John chapter 14. The other is Galatians chapter 3 and Galatians chapter 4. We will also go to Genesis chapter 3, 12, 15, 18. So we will be doing quite a bit of study, but I need you to stay with me. The question that comes up with regards to this issue of whether or not we teach only grace without law or whether we teach law within grace by the power of God. We want to clarify that a little bit today. There are those who count their righteousness by the keeping of the law. This week, this last week, I've been having some discussions on the internet with some friends, some family, who also, like me, observe the Sabbath. And I personally have found in my Bible study that the Sabbath is a requirement in order for me to acknowledge my Creator. If I don't acknowledge Him by the keeping of the Sabbath, who is Jesus going to take me to? He has to take me to the Creator. That is redemption. Hebrews chapter 4 speaks to that. We'll come to that one day because that is also part of the covenant. But the keeping of the Sabbath does not earn me salvation. Salvation is not earned by keeping one commandment or another. And time after time, we hear those that measure their righteousness by keeping the Sabbath, or those that measure their righteousness by what they think is keeping all the commandments, they throw at us this phrase and this passage, from John chapter 14 and verse 15. And what I will do is to help those friends and family who build their righteousness on this commandment. I will give them a deeper, a stronger argument to keep the law. And then we will dismantle that argument based on the scriptures. And what is that verse? In John chapter 14, verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. It's pretty straightforward. And based on that, we, those that have grown up in a denomination that feels that we are more righteous than the rest of the world and somehow we are remnant where the remnant have already done their job at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Those of us that feel that we are somehow more righteous than others beat up the others and say, you don't keep the commandments of God, thus you are going straight to hell. I saw a, 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 a post on Facebook my Facebook, one of my friends, said, I should actually pull it up on the phone and read it to you. All Adventists are heading to heaven and all Roman Catholics are going to hell because we keep the Sabbath. I'm paraphrasing. How sad. How sad on two counts. One, that somehow you believe you're going to go to heaven because you keep the Sabbath. And somehow you believe that others are going to go to hell because they don't keep the Sabbath? Romans chapter 1 through 3 is calling you, my friend. 
is beckoning you to study what God says about those that don't know the law. And Romans chapter 4 is screaming. It says, by faith, Abraham was considered righteousness, not by works. Let me strengthen this misapplication of the scripture and a misunderstanding of the scripture by arguing on the other side. John 14, 15 says, if you love me, keep the commandment. Let's go to verse 21. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my father. And I too will love them and show myself to them. This passage now strengthens verse 15. In other words, those that love me have to keep the commandments. And this becomes the entire argument to state that when Jesus comes, that we have to be perfectly righteous and keeping all the commandments. The misapplication comes from the wrong application of the principles of biblical exegesis. The principles of biblical interpretation. You cannot take a verse here and there. You cannot do what is called proof texting to prove a point. Because when we do that, we misuse the scriptures that God gave to us. Let's read a little bit more. Philip has said to Jesus, Show us the Father. And Jesus is responding here in John 14. What we're going to do now is contextualize. We're going to bring these passages, these verses into context. So we understand what the Bible is saying. And then there's a wider context to this smaller context within John. Within John, the context is this. Philip is saying, show us the Father. And Jesus says, don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you, this is verse 9, anyone who has seen me has seen what? The Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father, what? Living in me. Who is doing what? His work. So how was Jesus keeping the law? Through his own strength? No, Jesus himself was keeping the law by the strength of the Father because he was completely human. By the Spirit of God in him. Believe me, verse 11, when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least Believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing. So now, how has Jesus been doing the works? By the Father living in him. So how am I going to do the works? By my own strength. Let's make sure I follow all the commandments. Is that it? No! How am I going to do it? I'm going to do it the same way that Jesus did it. By the Father living in me. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask for anything in my name and I will do it. And by the way, I just want to stop here just for one moment. People misuse this last little phrase that I just said as well. People go around and say, I want a great big house. Why? Because Jesus said, I will do whatever you ask of me. People pray that God will give me a promotion because Jesus said, oh, because Jesus said, whatever you ask of me, I will give it to you. The context of that verse is our lives our spiritual lives, whatever you ask of the Father to transform me in my life, 
to make me a loving, gentler, nicer person, God will do it in me. That is the context. Now comes that dangerous line, verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. What is the context of that? If you love me, keep my, my, keep my commandments. The Bible just told me how to keep my commandments. Not holding the hand of Jesus, but having Jesus inside of me by his spirit. And I will ask the Father, verse 16, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. That spirit. That spirit. That spirit is going to be inside of you. The John 20, 22, Jesus said, when they believed, when Thomas and the, and the other apostles believed Jesus, what did he say? He breathed on them that spirit. And that spirit transformed them from being scared little babies hiding in a room to becoming giants of faith and going there and preaching when the government told them to shut up. They said, we cannot be quiet, but preach that what we have seen and heard. The world cannot accept him. Because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him. For he lives with you and will be what? In you. Verse 17 of chapter 14. The world doesn't see him. But he lives in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long the world will not see me anymore. But you will see me because I live you also will live. And where does he live? He lives in the heart of the converted. On that day, you will realize that I am in the Father. And you are in me. And I am in you. Verse 20. Take that. Write that on your head. Write it on your hand. Write it in your heart. On that day, you will realize that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. You get it? How do you keep the commands? With Jesus living in your heart. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show, them my, show myself to them. I'm not going to take the time just now to go and have a discussion on understanding the word advocate here. We'll do that another day. We'll skip on to verse 15, which really should be a passage that we know by heart. And the reason is this clarifies the question of living a righteous life. Jesus goes on to explain how we're going to live the law. And he says, I am the vine and my father is a gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Pruning here means you will have some difficulties. Pruning hurts. Cutting the branch, it hurts. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. In other words, you are already justified. Before God, you are clean. But the process of growth of the fruit will take time and it will be painful. That is the process of sanctification where you fall and you stand up in God's grace and you walk the walk. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by it self. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Nobody, nobody can be righteous. Nobody's righteous works. Nobody's keeping the Sabbath. Nobody's keeping any commandment can earn righteousness before God. Verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. But there are those that I would call false prophets and false teachers who say, that in order to come to God, you must first be righteous. 
and then God will accept you into his kingdom. God will accept us into his kingdom if we're righteous, but it's the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Not my own. I cannot do anything that is righteous. I want to draw your attention to Galatians chapter 4. And if we have time, we will touch on Galatians chapter 3, which in itself requires an entire year, one whole year of studies, Galatians chapter 3 alone. I'm going to go right to verse 21. This is the Apostle Paul talking to people in Galatia. Galatia is a region or a county which has many churches, not a town. And here there have been people who have been converted to accept Christianity. And after Paul has been here and taught them, some zealots, Jewish zealots have come and told these pagan Christians, the new Christians, that they must follow the law and keep the law in order to be considered for righteousness. Now, here's Paul, verse 21. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, you get that? Those of you that want to keep the law, who's he talking to? He's not just talking to the people in Galatia. He's talking to these people today who think they're going to earn their righteousness by the law. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh. And by his son, the free woman was born as the result of divine promise. Do you get the two difference? The one was by the works of the flesh, who was a slave. That woman was not his wife, it was his slave. And it was by his works and by her works that that son was born. And what about the other woman? Was not the slave. She was his wife. Verse 24, these things are being taken figuratively. In other words, figuratively, this is just an example. In the Old Testament, for us to understand the two covenants. The women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears the children who are to be slaves. Pay attention. The first woman represents the children who are slaves. And they are represented as slaves where? At Mount Sinai. What happened at Mount Sinai? The law was given. Not just the Ten Commandments, the entire Pentateuch. All five books of the Moses are written about and talk about the children of Israel. How they came out of Egypt and how they went into the promised land. So these people were under the law and they were under slavery. They were slaves to the law. Now, Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. Get it? What was happening in Jerusalem? The Jews were trying to gain salvation by their works in Jerusalem. They were trying to achieve righteousness. And I can guarantee you, not one of us can be more fussy and detailed about keeping the Sabbath than the Pharisees there. And the Apostle Paul refers to himself as, I was a Pharisee of Pharisees, Hebrew of Hebrews. They are trying to earn their salvation through the law, by the keeping of the law. But the Jerusalem that is above is free. And she is our mother, for it is written, Be glad, barren woman, 
You who never bore a child, shout for joy and cry aloud. You who were never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. Now, brothers and sisters, like Isaac and children are children of promise. At that time, the son born according to the flesh persecuted the son born by the power of the spirit. I'm going to stop here for a moment. The symbology and the parables are amazing. Those that lived by the law saw themselves as being the rightful heirs. They thought they were right. They thought they were righteous. And they persecuted the son and the descendants of the son who did not come under that slavery of the law. Is that not happening today? Those that believe that they're living a righteous life, those that believe that they are following the law of God will point a finger at you and say, you are not following the law, so you're going straight to hell. I ask you this. Sarah, the other woman, the other covenant. How much, how much did she contribute to the miracle of having a son? Was there any work? Was her body even able to have a child? No. Was there any works involved? No. It was all a gift. It was all a gift. A free gift. There was no works. None. But God here rejects he rejects the seed and the woman that claims the works and accepts the seed from the woman who gets the free gift, the free gift. What does the scripture say? Verse 29 and 30. Verse 30, but what does the scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son. You get that, my friends? Any Bible student anywhere that is listening, get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Can it be any clearer than that? Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. When God cut a covenant with Abraham, he said three things he promised them. He promised them seed, Land where the seed could prosper. So that they could prosper and bless the entire world through them. The plan of salvation was put in place in the Garden of Eden. And disclosed to Abraham who may not have understood it completely. But God did not make the Jewish people special just for the sake of making them special. He made them special that they may be instrumental in saving the entire world. That's why the Bible tells us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son who came through Abraham and through the Jews. He didn't come here to save the Jews. He came here to save the whole world. Through the vehicle that God used the people of Israel as the remnant. And the only work of the remnant was to make sure that they stayed in the straight and narrow. That the seed may come and when they left, when they veered off the path, God punished them to bring them back. 
so that when the seed comes, that salvation would be available to the entire world. That is why when Jesus died on the cross, the curtain was torn because the work of the remnant was complete. It was done. That promise of life and that promise of eternal life that was given to Abraham now became available to the entire world. The whole world. So Paul becomes the preacher to the non-Jews, that entire world, as planned by God. Peter went to the Jews with the other apostles. And God called Paul to preach the Gentiles. That brings us to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. You know, Romans chapter 1, 16, 17. The most critical Bible verses, I believe. By grace are you saved through faith. But the greatest chapter, the greatest book in the Bible that explains the plan of salvation is the book of Galatians. This is the book that Martin Luther wrote the greatest commentary on. This is the book that freed the world to understand salvation when it was covered and buried by the Roman Catholic Church. This is the book. Paul writes to the Galatians. He is concerned that they are falling away from the truth that they have learned, the gospel. And what does the word gospel mean? Good news. I'm going to go to verse, uh, chapter 3 and then I'm going to come back to chapter 2 for just a moment. And later on, God willing, one day we'll have time to uh, go into chapter 3 more deeply. But I want to read as much of chapter 3 as I can today. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? We just read the means of the flesh in chapter 4 was what? By works. You foolish Galatians. Do you know, the Apostle Paul is continuously a diplomat. When you read Corinthians, people in Corinth did terrible things. He's very nice to them. He lists all the things they do bad, but then every time he lists something bad, he, he tells them something nice. He, he compliments them. He's a, he's a, he's a real gentleman. But when it comes to Galatians, he does not hold back anything. He doesn't hold back anything. He lets them have it. He says, you foolish, you stupid people. Did you receive the spirit by the works of your law? In other words, did you make yourself so righteous that the spirit came after you became righteous? Is that what happened? No. The spirit to transform you came when you believed. Have you experienced, verse 4, have you experienced so much in vain? If it really was in vain, so again ask, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? God is not going to make miracles in your life. God is not going to transform you. God is not going to sanctify you. He's not going to give you the fruits of the Spirit because of your works. He's going to do it because of the Spirit that lives in you. So also, verse 6, Abraham did what? Believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Romans chapter 4 says the same thing. He only believed. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Now he's talking to Gentiles. Unless there's somebody here who was born a Jew. He's talking to us. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. 
Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. You get that? You get that? God didn't tell Abraham anything about righteousness by works. God announced to Abraham back then the gospel. What is the gospel? The good news that you shall live by faith. That is the gospel. That is the gospel. Not by works, but by faith. You're saved by grace through faith. Continue. Speaking about the Gentiles. God would justify the Gentiles by faith, not by works, and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham in that covenant that what? All nations will be blessed through you. How clear is that? Is this not a commentary on the covenant with Abraham? The entire covenant with Abraham was not about the Jews. It was not about the promised land. It was about saving the entire world. It was saving all humanity through the Jews and the seed that came from the Jews. So those who rely, verse 9, those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Verse 10, pay attention. Your friends and relatives may need to read this. Chapter 3, verse 10. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, curse is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Not just the Sabbath, not just one law, not just two law, but every single law. Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God. This is not me saying it. This is the Apostle Paul. This is God through the Apostle Paul. Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God. Because the righteous will what? Live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says, the person who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, Curse is everyone who is hung on a pole. Do you remember the promise to David that he will have a son whose throne will last for, forever? And it says, And when he sins, he will be punished. Why? Because he became sin for us. He became sin for me that I may be Come righteous in place of him. Curse is everyone who is hung on a pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. The deal with Abraham was that all nations will be blessed by you and by your seed, and that the promise of the Spirit will be fulfilled, that the Spirit may abide in our hearts. In Jeremiah 31, that the law will be written in our hearts. It is not what goes into the body, but that comes out of it. That makes a difference. If I take the law, and I write down the law, and I try and decipher the law, and make sure I try and follow everyone, I can guarantee you there'll be things that I miss. Because we are unable to keep the law to be as holy as our Father in heaven. The Bible says, be ye perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. There is only one who is as perfect as our Father in heaven. That is Jesus Christ. That is Jesus. That's it. Not me, not you, not anybody. 
And if that is the measure, the measure is not keeping the Sabbath. The measure is that we are sealed by the blood of the Lamb. The day of atonement. The day of atonement comes after the judgment in the priests, in, in, the, in the festivals of Jews. The feast of trumpets announces the judgment, the day of judgment, on the first of Nisan. And the judgment takes place in that first ten days. The day of atonement, people are declared righteous. To misuse the day of atonement. And to say that on the Day of Atonement starts a judgment is a glaring, obvious mistake that the people who hold that don't know and understand the Jewish feasts or purposely misuse them. One of the two, but we'll come back to that. Verse 15, brothers and sisters, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Singular, not plural seed, singular. Scripture does not say to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. What I mean is this. The law introduced 430 years later, this is 430 years after Abraham, does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it, long, then it no longer depends on the promise. But God and his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. Why then was the law given at all? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. A mediator, however, implies more than one party, but God is one. Is the law, therefore, opposed to the promise of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, watch this, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. Get that? If a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But the scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin. So that what was promised, being given through, through faith in Jesus, might be given to those who believe. My friends, go to chapter 2, where Paul is explaining what his relationship is with Christ and with the spreading of the gospel. He is explaining all the things that need to be done and all the things that have to be preached. And in chapter 1, he introduces and he says this, I am astonished, verse 6, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. You get that? A different gospel. Which is really no gospel at all. Do you know where this different gospel was seen over there, but it's also seen in the Roman Catholic Church? It was really introduced, if you use the word charity, in 1 Corinthians 13, the word charity comes from Latin caritas. And what it really says is that you do your best and whatever you don't accomplish, God will make up the difference. You do your best and whatever you can't do, God will do the rest. That lie, that lie found its way into the church where the entire church on earth was following that, trying to earn salvation by their works. And that same lie continues to be in the doctrines of those that call themselves a remnant. That you have to take out all the sin in your life and in your heart. 
until you're perfect. You can't do it. Only God can do it in me. Only God can do it in you. Read on verse 7, which is no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. Is that happening in your life? But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one preached to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. We cannot, we cannot let the gospel of Jesus Christ be perverted and hidden under the lies of false prophets and false teachings. Cannot. If you are going to keep the law, if you are anxious to judge and see how great you are, don't do it by the keeping of the Sabbath. Don't do it by making sure that, oh, I don't steal, I don't do that. Don't do it by that. The Apostle Paul was having a debate on circumcision and keeping the other laws and all the festivals. So, in that discussion, he says, he had a debate with the other apostles. And they came to a conclusion. And read that conclusion in chapter 2. Verse 8 on. For God, who was at work in Peter as an apostle, to the circumcised, so Peter was going to the Jews, was also at work in me, an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Cephas, and John, all those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. In other words, the other apostles accepted me also as an apostle. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles. They agreed to the fulfillment of God's promise that the blessing would go to all nations, not just the Jews. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. All they asked was that we should continue to remember, get this, if you really want to see how righteous you are, whether you love God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself, read this, the only thing that all the apostles agreed to they all asked, all they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor. The very thing I had been eager to do all along. You get it? If you want to measure your righteousness, take a look and see how you treat those that are unlovable. Do you feed the hungry? Do you take what you have and sell it so those that don't have it, they can have it? Or do you accumulate wealth? Which one is it? You think your righteousness is measured by keeping a law? Which law? The Apostle Paul says there is only one. And Jesus confirms that in Luke and in Matthew. When I was sick, you didn't come to see me. When I was in prison, you didn't come to see me. When I was naked, you didn't clothe me. When I was hungry, you didn't feed me. Get away from me. And what they say, but we did everything. We kept the law. We kept the law. Jesus says, get away from me. I don't know you. That is the spirit of God living in you and me. Galatians chapter 5. Fruits of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience, tenderness. These are the spirit's fruits. Not the commandments by which we feel that we can win the righteousness of God. Now I want to read you a little bit more from chapter 2. Verse 15. We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, 
but by faith in Jesus Christ. So, so we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. Verse 19, for the law, for through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. But what? Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ would die for nothing. Foolishness. Foolishness. We go looking for the Antichrist. We go running and see where we can put the number 666. We call the Vatican all kinds of names. We fail to look at the reality. And that is this. When we diminish the role of Jesus Christ in my salvation and my eternal life, we ourselves teach the gospel of the Antichrist. That other gospel, the Apostle Paul says, they, they may be cursed. May be cursed. The Antichrist is in our homes. It's on our bookshelves telling us that we need to earn our righteousness. Only righteousness that God sees is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus Christ, through the Spirit of God, lives in your hearts and in mine, we become transformed, never to notice or see our own righteousness. We continuously see our sinfulness, as the Apostle Paul says. Those things I want to do, I can't do. Those things I don't want to do, I do. And I die every day because I sin. We live in sin. But God doesn't see it that way. He begins to transform us day by day by the power of His Spirit. We don't do away with the law because if we do away with the law, we cannot define sin. Sin can only be defined by the law. By looking at the law, we know what is sin? By looking at the law, we know that we need a Savior. No wonder. Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you light. For my burden is light, right? And my yoke is easy. Yoke is easy, and my burden is light. It's not about trying to earn our righteousness. It is about submitting to the will of God and to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 10, verse 10. I want to go there with you to close. Well, let's... Uh, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put 
to shame. Verse 13, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Verse 10, sorry, verse 1 of chapter 10. Brothers and sisters, this, by the way, is a message from me. Just like the Apostle Paul had friends and relatives in the Jewish faith. I have friends and relatives in the Seventh-day Adventist faith where I grew up. And my study more and more and more is showing me that we have reason to be concerned for our family and friends who are under the shadow of that church. Because through righteousness, they are taught to earn their righteousness through their own works. And that is in that false doctrine of 1844 the Day of Atonement, which is misused and misapplied. We'll study that later. But as I think about my friends and relatives under the darkness of that other gospel, I read this, chapter 10 of Romans, verse 1. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites, what I would say my Adventist friends, is that they may be saved, for I can testify about them that they're zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge, since they do not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own. They did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the culmination of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. I want to invite all of you who are in church, those that are online, take your Bible. Take your Bible. Examine everything I said and everything I say every week. Put it against the Word of God. Do not use any other source outside the Bible that professes to be a prophet of God. Everything we need is right here. Study this. Examine the truth by the word of God. Because if you are a believer, you have a responsibility to yourself, to your family, to your friends, and to others within your churches. That you may come to the real Jesus Christ. The Jesus Christ of the scriptures. God bless you. Amen.